two nerds and an intellectual sharing experience and laughs along the way. Hello, and I am joined by my co-hosts, the Madame Sue. Hi. And our special guest, Pam. Hello, Pam. Hi, it's Star Sage. Getting used to PK. this. <laughs> <laughs> So if you would, Pam, since you are the guest, um, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, if you would. Well, I live in Maryland, and I have a couple of pets here, two dogs and three birds, and I am a uh, registered massage therapist in, for the state. Uh, kind of boring, being don't have kids, but I... Do spend you know whatever time I can traveling, and I don't know if it just uh, did you want political information? Uh, you know, I mix. There are a few things I'm conservative about. <laughs> well, I, I I think that uh, before I think I'm, before you had mentioned uh, that there was a um, a uh, a background behind your your name. Ah, you're correct. Yeah, it was politics and massage. So that's where I got my nifty alias from. I think I'm really tired. I've got to a couple of putting in a lot of extra hours at work, which is not physically easy work. So and I've been kind of spacey for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I imagine. But it will all end up pretty good is, is a good thing. And Basie kind of coincides with that. I am also a huge fan of a show called Killjoys on Sci-Fi Channel, and one of the things I some more, and I'm doing a, a Twitter chat for the convention audience with one of the stars of the show. Oh, well, that sounds fun. Yeah, I handle a lot better at this point. <laughs> you handle a lot better what? It has our I need to refresh Twitter. myself about that show because um, I know that they've just started a new season. Is that right? They just started the new season. We're two episodes in. You know how cool it is in space. It American woman as the lead, and I can also claim another bit of fame. Michelle Avretta is the show creator, and I've kind of said that if Michelle Nichols is up to it, it would be marvelous to bring in this that lead character's back family and have Michelle play her mother. And I was chatting with Michelle on Twitter, <laughs> who absolutely loved the idea. Oh, yeah. I think it's kind of coming full circle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Nichols had to get Leonard Nimoy to get her a correct even paycheck back then. And now we've come to this point where there is an in the lead of a sci-fi show who is smart, who is kicking butt, but mostly her main character attribute is she is smart. Yeah. I really love like hmm. Okay. So... Um from here, we usually go into a segment where we talk about our weeks. This is called our Peaks and Valleys. So I thought we would go ahead and start off with talking to our fair duchess, Sue. How was your week, Sue? Well, actually, I would say that my the highlight, the my peak and valley are pretty much the same thing. Um, I have finished my phys- I have apparently finished my physical therapy for my shoulder. Um, Yay. However, it still is not very strong, and it still does not reach above my head. It doesn't go up to my... it. My I cannot lift my arm up to shoulder height. Mm-hmm. And so I am pleased to be finished with physical therapy because it's not my favorite thing in the world. I however, imagine, I no. am not pleased with what my physical therapy has done for me because it hasn't gotten any better. Hmm. I, I mean, it had. Well, I shouldn't say it hasn't gotten any better, but it hasn't gotten. It hasn't gotten as well as I would like it to be. But physical therapy is really expensive. Yeah. And I can't afford to pay for it on my own. So. 
Now, I think you had mentioned before that you've had your other shoulder operated on, and I remember you were saying that you didn't think that it was healing the same way as the other? No, but then they did the, the type of reconstruction surgery they did on the two shoulders are different. Oh, okay. So the uh, healing so wasn't that, expected to be the same, I guess. Is that what the doctor's I guess expectation I, I was? I presume that's true. They don't seem to think that it's strange that it's different. They think that part of the reason that I haven't, my arm hasn't gotten as strong as it as it ought to be, and is not able to lift above my uh, above my head, is because it wasn't very strong before the 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 arm and the shoulder were not very strong before the surgery. Now, this is this your dominant arm? No, this isn't. This is my left oh. arm, and I am my dominant arm is my right arm. Okay. Which was the surgery that they did four or five years ago. I see. And I can lift that above my head. Mm-hmm. Well, you can't see it as I just lift my arm. <laughs> I, always, I always do that when I say I can lift my arm above my head. I just do that because I am kind of strange. <laughs> what was the right. initial? What was the initial problem? Do you, do you um, need the surgery? I, I have I have arth- I had arthritic ah. shoulders, and what they did is they took out they opened my shoulder and cut off the the end of the um, whatever. Is that the tip? That's not the tibia, is it? The the shoulder the no, that's the whatever it is. The arm that goes or the bone that goes from your the, the, well, was it the shoulder, shoulder blade or the humerus? I, it, oh, that's the humerus. That's the humerus. Okay. Okay. See, I knew you would know this. But, and then they <laughs> yeah. off the and then they cut off the ball joint or whatever is connected to your shoulder, and then they replace that whole partial with plastic or plastic and aluminum or something i don't know exactly but i i do know that it has that they there are screws in see if we had uh, if she had had the surgery uh, before well, I mean, we started recording we might have called her barbie instead of sue <laughs> it's true <laughs> and as a as a bad doctor's joke well, once probably said uh, and you'll never play the violin again Yes, well, <laughs> well, I've never played it before. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, well, but... Well, but I, mean, they, I have worked on people with limited shoulder mobility and been able to restore a good... I can't make you promises based on individual cases, but you may want to talk to talk to your doctor or whatever and clear and see if you're cleared for massage and then get somebody who is like a privately practicing like yeah. tell them that you know what you need work on because I you know I've done it and I'm working you know for another I'm yeah. working for and, and you know, we have the liberty to practice that yeah. type of therapy as long as we have medical clearance mm-hmm. well the f- very first time I had surgery on a joint was my left arm, but I had that was they did they scoped it I guess is what they called it. They went in and they took out a couple pieces of of bone or cartilage that was floating around in the shoulder area, mm-hmm. and they scraped the rough edges off of the bones. And then they had they had mm-hmm. me do some. Uh, well, at my request, they let me do some physical therapy, <laughs> um, and uh, somebody's alarm went off. Um, and I had massage therapy at that time, mostly because they suggested mm-hmm. that. Uh, well, no, I saw I saw a sign on the bulletin board of where I had physical therapy, and I asked about it, and they and. Mm-hmm. And they uh, checked with the doctor and with my insurance, and they said I could do it. So I went ahead and did it. Uh, but I had really much better insurance then. So speaking then, of graphic details, have I ever mentioned? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Just a brief segue. Um, apparently, when my sister was young, uh, she used to watch PBS with my father, and he used mm-hmm. to watch different surgeries. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, um, you know, apparently she wasn't bothered by things like open heart surgery, but when it came to the miracle of childbirth, she got a little sick. Oh, yeah? 
old was she when she was watching this? Oh, I, I think that she may not have been uh, in her early teens at the time, probably. Oh. So, oh, that, yeah, it's that might a been, sensitive topic, but um, that, that that would have been just too. Uh, yeah, that would have touched home too. Too mm-hmm. too closely, I think, or too right. something. So you I'm were not s- sure in the early teens I would have been able to handle that. <laughs> <laughs> so you were saying that that was your high point and low point of your week? Yeah, because well, it was a high point because I finished with physical therapy, but it was a right. low point because it didn't do enough. Oh, well, and hopefully. So I'd like to be doing more physical therapy, so I don't right. know. Exactly. Well, Other than doing what I can at home is all I can think of at the moment. Right. Well, hopefully some of what Pam shared will, will help you figure that out. I will talk to my doctor and mm-hmm. so, or doctor. Um, I have doctors. Mm-hmm. So at this point, we would like to uh, turn over the peaks and valleys to our latest member. Pam, would you like to tell us a little bit about your week? Uh, we talk about the uh, best and worst moments, our peaks and our valleys. My highlight of my week was that I have a co-worker who agreed to take my two pups in to sit them while I'm away. Just that my dogs are kind of not normal dogs. They're a challenge. One of them is a German Shepherd who is suffering from separation anxiety because of it. They've gone through psychologically. And obviously, you know, my pup has had more than a few owners before I got her and doesn't understand that that's not going to happen again. So we had a test try, and they did okay, and she's got a big fenced backyard, and I'm looking forward to seeing how she does. But that's pretty much it. Oh, okay. So yeah. it, it sounds like you, you, you have a special needs baby, and you found a good daycare. <laughs> it sounds potentially we're going to do one more test before mm-hmm. we leave. low point of the week I, I editor's footnote the, the following is a discussion of the events surrounding the July 2016 yeah, shooting incident in Dallas, Texas involving 25 year old Micah Johnson and five police officers then you find out that they're targeting cops and he's good enough that he's picking them out of this insanely dashing crowd and I literally did not understand for, I would say, the first 30, 40 seconds that this wasn't something somebody made up. This was a major American city where they had this sort of detachment to it. But I, I guess this is... Well, my understanding and is... I, mean, I don't know how everybody else feels about that. Mm-hmm. Well, it was terrible. Um, I understand that the gentleman had had... Uh, had had been in the National Guard, if not the armed services, I don't know anymore what the difference between the National Guard and the regular armed services are, but but he had served over in Iraq or Afghanistan, and and perhaps it had sniper training. Um, and he kept telling people white people needed to die, and apparently they did. Um, but... I, I think that's very sad. I think it's really bad that we've gotten to a point where where we're killing each other no matter who they are. Um, right. Uh, it's just it just having killed. Well, I I gather that that's something of a response to the two shootings earlier that week where the black men were killed in traffic stops, uh, and and he apparently thought it, it just thought that that was enough and but he had apparently also been saying to people that white that white people needed to die and, and i that, know when i heard about the story the way that it was revealed in media in the beginning was they were reluctant to identify the shooter and you know basically explain the fact that he was a black american because mm-hmm. uh, you know, with the recent shootings that have uh, happened elsewhere, they wanted to focus on the fact that it was a shooting and not necessarily racially motivated. Yeah. I but think that is also kind that's of that's wise also because, well, I mean, if the mentality where they are even able to do this, then to me, it, it, 
this may have been his trigger, and it may have been a major trigger, and yeah, may not have had that particular trigger, but this also could have been somebody whose trigger was, and I posted this to somebody on Facebook who was – somebody in line in front of him could have bought the wrong color of Care Bear. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, that could have been enough to set somebody off. Mm-hmm. You got yeah. the pink one. You didn't get the blue one. I'm going to go shoot people. You know? <laughs> yeah, it, it's possible. Um, Apparently, this is just where we are now. I'm, I no longer work at a mall where it's open access at a sales floor. Hmm. I'm now just in a room who they're not going to be able to conceal anything. We'll put it that way. They're going to have a sheet on, but that's yeah. kind of it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's I do feel, that's, that's, I do that's feel safe now. now. <laughs> well, they might be packing, but it's a, that's an entirely different matter. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we're trained to handle that sort of thing. Well, yeah. But, you know, but, uh, turn yeah. over. <laughs> but you know, I'm going to know if you have a gun, put it that yeah. way. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I I just it, it's it's something bad that has happened, and it's some. But we haven't gotten over the racial problems in this country, and we need to talk about it. Yeah, and I I listen to quite a bit of NPR during my work day. Just a a quick add on to this. Um, my local NPR station was uh, discussing some of the. Um, subjects that have come out of the recent gun violence and of course uh, some of that being uh, ra racial hatred and bigotry and one of the things that I remember was recently said in an interview uh, was from a black American and they said that you know from the the third party's perspective or the outside party you know we pay taxes we contribute to the uh, betterment of the society and we're still treated as if this was the 60s and um, in my local community we actually had an organized peaceful protest that occurred on a Friday after work I was leaving my work which is in a downtown and the neighborhood streets were being uh, barricaded to prevent traffic into the protest area and I got out of town uh, you know without delay and I checked the news later on and there there wasn't any sort of incidents of violence but there was a great deal of exposure in the media in that um, there were of course more police present than they needed for that amount of protesters and one woman who was there in the protest was arrested, and it was counted that there were six men who took this woman down to handcuff her. And she said on the radio in her interview afterwards that she is only a 130-pound woman. What need was there for six men to pin her down? Well, <clears throat> Uh, there probably wasn't, since she probably was neither crazy nor hostile. Uh, but just on the far side of, of nonsense, or not nonsense, um, if you're dealing with people who are mentally unstable, their strength is disproportionate to their, to their body size and their muscular abilities. Mm-hmm so that it might actually take six men to take down a 130-pound woman. So it was it, anticipation. It, it was probably that. It was probably uh, it, it because it uh, – having. It having, also depends on how she – Yeah, I, I mean, probably in, a, in, in the instance where she was at, it probably wasn't even anticipated. Mm -hmm. But I have been in situations where – it can take a lot to take down a, a small person. And actually, the smaller they are, the harder it is to take a person down. If you've ever tried to grab a hold of a child who is acting out, mm -hmm. they can be really hard to get a hold, get under control. Just physically, I, you know, uh, they can hurt you pretty bad, no matter how good, how good a size you are. Well, and I, and I um, you know, from 
my sister Ronnie, uh, she's, a, she's a therapist, and mm -hmm. uh, she works with troubled youth. I remember she told me an incident that occurred with a school child that she was counseling. And, you know, Ronnie isn't a very big woman. She's possibly maybe 5'2", and yeah. she's quite svelte. And um, it doesn't take a lot to hurt her. She has she has a chocolate lab, and that dog um, was crazed one day only because you know she hadn't been let out by um, my brother-in-law. So the poor you know the poor thing was eager to go outside. Yeah. <laughs> but such a force was exacted on that leash that it broke my sister's wrist. Mm-hmm. So, but getting back to mm -hmm. us, a person of small, this child who, granted, was overweight for I want to say a seven-year-old, yeah, um, put so much force upon my sister in this situation that um, they actually broke two of her ribs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Um, but, yeah, um, and 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 it's just. Uh, Having worked in a mental institution, I know that when when a person who is who has mental difficulties and gets upset about something and, and gets angry, that what they can do to to themselves, other people, furniture, walls, doors, uh, what have you, is 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 much more than what you would anticipate from their size or their weight. Right. And given that, usually in a, prote in a protest march, mm -hmm. there's nobody that's really angry. Yeah. They may be a lot of people shouting, but they aren't generally angry. I mean, if you just look at people marching, it's really hard to be involved in a march of any kind and really be angry at particular people or anybody because you're, there's a number of different things you've got your mind on. Um, and there's a certain amount of jocularity amongst people who are participating in that because you're talking to people, you're meeting people, you're, you know, you're, you're interacting with other people that mm -hmm. in a way that you aren't at other times. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay. So, um, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to go uh, talk about my week. So, I would say, and I'll have to think about this for a moment. I'll talk my way through it, as always. Um, let's see, the high point of my week. Well, there's been a, a few good things that have happened in the last week, so it's possible that I may not have... Well, actually, there's always work, but um, <laughs> let's see. Since we last spoke... Um, I went to a family cookout where we met my stepfather, who we'll call Mr. Mooney. Um, he's a retired accountant, and I think that that, uh, you know, is a is a good name for him, Mr. Mooney. So we uh, we went to a cookout at Mr. Mooney's house, my stepfather, and uh, mom's been gone for a number of years now, and um, this poor gentleman is in his almost mid 80s, so. He's all by himself and elderly, and um, apparently he's found himself back in the dating scene, and he has a home in Florida that he goes to in the winter. Well, he's let us know that he's met someone else, or someone new, rather, and he felt it was time that we should meet Aww. her because now they're going to marry. And Oh, wow. Course, um, <laughs> it, of course, my, my one sister, um, Betty... She uh, she's a little more emotional than the rest of the family. In fact, I I uh, think that she and my aunt are are um, possibly you know from the same cloth. But um, <laughs> she, she it's hard to tell if she was upset about Mr. Mooney getting remarried or if she was jealous because well to put it bluntly, she's been in an unhappy marriage because she got married at 17 mm. and. Um, she and her husband don't necessarily have a happy home life. The children have been encouraged to stay at home well into their middle twenties, just so that she's not alone with him. Um, but anyways, bringing oh back, um, we got to meet Mr. Mooney's fiance. Uh, we'll call her Judy. And Judy is a very nice lady. 
Um, she comes from the South. I guess she grew up in Kentucky, and she still has the accent. Oh, how sweet. And, um, <laughs> I, you know, it, it's like how they say you look for the attributes you found most endearing in your parent when you look for a mate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there are similar qualities in Judy t that Mr. Mooney saw in my mom because she's got a sense of humor and she likes to kid. Yeah. Um, but the funniest part about it is Ronnie and her husband decided that they were going to go undercover, so to speak, um, because Mr. Mooney is a little conservative and he's church going. He, teased, <laughs> he and mom teased Ronnie and her now husband when they were living together that they, they shouldn't be shacked up and living in sin. Well, right. um, a quick trip down the hallway revealed the truth that Mr. Mooney's no saint because they're <laughs> cohabitating. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it, those family gatherings are just the best because my stepbrother was visiting from out of state and it's just pure gold when other people ask the questions that you wish you had the nerve to. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I felt like I was a fly on the wall because here uh, my brother Jughead's girlfriend, we'll call her Ethel because, well, she's a lush. And um, <laughs> uh, my stepbrother asked Ethel if um, – the house that they were buying together, mind you, they've only been together maybe nine months, if it was going to be in both of their names. And, of course, she explained the house was going to be in her name, but she would list Jughead on there, so that means occupant. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, my, my, my brother uh, owes child support for his two remaining children, and so, of course, an out-of-state residence will help ditch that. And um, and um, the other part of that that I just found delicious was that um, my stepbrother was talking to Ethel about um, her relationship with Jughead because, you know, he's from out-of-state, so he hasn't been around recently. Yeah. And he didn't know how things were going, so he asked her, she, he said, are you and Jughead married? And the look that came off of her face, <laughs> she said to my stepbrother, she says, well, I've recently gone through a divorce, so I'm in no hurry to get married again. But I <laughs> just thought that that was the best place to her. be <laughs> and uh, just just several things of uh, about my brother's personality um, you know it, it was one of those things where for the years that I lived away from home I always felt that I was the sore thumb that stuck out but when I would come home for a long weekend the drama that my brother exposed the family to made me feel normal <laughs> so I, I guess we gotta be thankful for some things, but um, so those that was the um, the peak of my week was um, the family cookout, and the valley. Well, that's going to be I'm afraid work related. <laughs> um, the candy shop has been wearing me out. And it has its ups and downs, and certainly the ups are when my boss makes me feel useful in that she'll have, like, a, an escalation issue, for example. And I know that I'm important because she'll ask me to help with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, mm -hmm. you think, why am I being picked on? But then you realize also, if you're being asked by your boss for help with that, it's because they trust you and you're important. So it's it's always nice when you're needed, but the lulls in between kind of make it difficult to stick around because, well, I, I think I might have touched on this in the past, but, you know, I'm at the point where I'm at a peak in my history with the company I haven't been in any one position for more than four or five years at a time, so I'm feeling like I may want to explore mm -hmm. other things, 
but the problem with the structure of my organization is we operate in different states and the other functions aren't necessarily local. Ah, oh, so, that would be really bad. Yeah, so I I am not I I don't have the option to explore the non-local portions because I have family here and I own a house and I'm really not interested in relocating. Not that they yeah. would pay for any of that, but you know if I decide I want to do something else, um, I have I may to find have a different company to do it with. Yeah, and I was I was talking about that with a coworker. I said, you know, it's pretty bad when your chances of going to work for another company are better than you doing something different from your own. And well, actually, I think in this day and age, so to speak, uh, it's not. that's not uncommon. Yeah, I just hate to think of the loss of benefits because, you yeah. know, when, when I left Ye Old Internet Emporium, I was within a year or so of getting my extra week of vacation. Mm-hmm. And that's just salt on the wound because, you know, and nothing says I love you like paid time off. It's true. It's like when I left my position at a state university and lost a month's worth of vacation in two weeks or three weeks of sick leave year or something. I, mm -hmm. I can't even remember what they were. 11 paid vacation days. Oh, and, and two weeks off of Christmas mm -hmm. because they shut down over Christmas time. I mean, that kind of um, that kind of stuff is just really hard to come by. And and working for a state, a particular type, like a state university or college of some sort, is about the only place you find that kind of uh, leave time. Mm -hmm. It's just not and, um, available elsewhere. And it just seemed to fall on deaf ears that I got my email today, one day after my anniversary with the company, and it was our, uh, you know, division president or whatever, and it basically said, oh, I'm so sorry for missing this important occasion, blah 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 hope you had a special day, and I just thought to myself, oh, yeah, it was special, all right. I didn't even get one of those $5 gift cards <laughs> management throws around like water. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, you and I, uh, Sue and I have worked for the same company before, and in those days, of course, they didn't have the budget cuts that they do with morale now, and I seem to recall more than one holiday season where we would be taken aside to a conference room and we'd be told, here, pick from one of these three big box stores and you get this handsome gift card to spend on yourself and now it's like a five dollar <laughs> gift card for starbucks and i'm like i'm sorry i'm going to spend more than that with tax on the item yeah so those yeah. were the peaks and valleys of my week well um, okay i'm really sorry about that <laughs> you know, I, I think I'll make do. I mean, um, the fact that I've celebrated my anniversary with the company makes me think twice about giving that up. It's yeah. just I wish I had options. And in my industry, I see a fair share of people who are older than me, and um, they've got, you know, more easily more than twice my seniority. And I just want to ask them, how did you do it? How are you still here? You know, ha has the light well, finally died in your eyes? <laughs> DJ, I think, you know, somebody has to be those people. And sadly... We never think about ourselves being those people, but sometimes it has to be somebody. Well, it's it's kind of like watching... It's kind of like watching, you know, a variation of one of these Scrooge stories. Yeah. You know, the ghost of Christmas past and the Christmas future. Mm -hmm. So these people with the seniority in the company are the ghosts of Christmas future. This is how it's going to be. And it, <laughs> it's not necessarily a bad thing because I have coworkers who have so much seniority that since they can't get a full day off, they just leave early and they go to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, as Dr. McCoy would say, it's for medicinal purposes. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll go ahead and move on to our topics of the week. Okay. 
Uh, Pam, did you have anything that you wanted to talk about this week? A very interesting, very cute article. And I was not aware that they had such such uh, niceties or animals. But apparently if you put a capybara in a zoo, other animals, and I saw dozens and dozens of pictures of dozens of different animals that like to snuggle with them. Now these are calm domestic animals, like ducks and chickens. And, and if you don't know what a capybara is, it's a very, very large, water-loving South American rodent. They go for about 50 or 60 pounds. All right. They look like giant beavers with no tail. <laughs> Apparently, they're just mm-hmm. adored by other animals. And I was going to say something clever about Brexit, but I saw this, and it was just too funny. <laughs> it was pri- <laughs> That is bizarre, and and they put these animals in in the zoo for for other animals to snuggle. Yeah, they're they're well, no, they just noticed it was happening. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they just they noticed just, that it was happening. They, like rats, they just worked their way into these cages, and and they were snug and with all sorts of animals, like. Well, yeah, it was kind of. They can be mixed with other animals. You know, sometimes you'll see a zoo that will have won't necessarily harm each other in the same pen, right? And so yeah. forth. And, you know, and they began noticing that these capybaras, especially turtles, seem to like turtles seem to like being around them. Maybe Aww. I think my only theory is that gen- they may have they may generate a lot of body heat and. You know, reptiles and amphibians are always looking for a source of yeah. heat. Maybe that's it. They had months back one where there were a bunch of ducks nestling on top of it, and it was just laying there like a giant. And it did. <laughs> 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 that, that is bizarre. Sue, did you have something you wanted to talk yes, about this week? I, I finished three. I have finished three books since I have talked to you last. I have read Leslie Stahl the. CBS, she's on CBS's 60 Minutes. Leslie Stahl has recently, and as in recently in the last five years or so, become a grandparent. And she has actually, she has found that being a grandparent has altered her life, perhaps more so than just being a parent. Uh, Not that she loves her grandchildren any more than she loves her daughter, but maybe, maybe she does. <laughs> but she has, so she has written a book on grandparenting. She has decided that being a grandparent was different than when her daughter was a, was young. And it is different, and that was different from when she was young. When her daughter was young and when Leslie was young, grandparenting was m- m- more similar than it ha- is now. And so she has written this book, and it is entitled Becoming Grandma, The Joys and Science of New Grandparenting, which chronicles her own experience with her grandchildren and was published in 2016. But it also goes out, she goes out and interviews people. She interviews women who have, who with their husbands or even alone, have come to having to raise their grandchildren. She talks about how sometimes they have to support their grandchildren because if they don't, maybe the grandkids don't get to eat because we're, we have really screwed up our economy somehow. So she has looked at grandparenting in all the different ways that grandparenting happens. And she tells us things like they, her, she and her husband and her daughter and her husband and their their oldest grandchild took a month's vacation in California one year, and they had rented a house there, and everybody came. There was five of them there. And she said after about an hour of playing with the child, every day she got tired because she's like, entertaining an infant is really hard, and maybe we don't always want to do that. When you want to be around your grandchildren... Being around them all the time and entertaining them all the time 
is a little different than just being their parent and taking them off to daycare or what have you. And as we're older, we may not have quite as much energy as we used to. Can't imagine that. But I was having two grandchildren of my own and just one daughter. I have a similar situation to Leslie Stahl. And I have had a similar reaction, I think, to my grandchildren. But it is a very good book if you're just interested in and some of the things that are happening in our society, she talks about the different ways that we are grandparenting. I was especially interested in what she had to say and, and the, what other people had to say about their raising their having to raise their grandchildren. I wish she had done more about that. I feel really awful about that. These are women who did not expect to do this, who thought they had raised their own children to be to be able to to have children and and to be good parents and not of not all of them are they are various reasons that they have to to raise their grandchildren and and so it is it is a very good book there's it is a little more personal than than many reporters write in their in books but it it has not lost the reporting style. She has gone out and talked to people and, and done research on, on this topic. I found an interesting story that I wanted to share with everyone. And as, uh, as I've been wont to do in the past, this is through a site called FARC, F-A-R-K, like kite. And um, so this particular article is called... You can help stop human trafficking with the Traffic Cam app. And that's Traffic Cam, spelled T R A F F I C K C A M. So, um, so the article says In a world where the phrase, oh God, not another app, often springs to mind, along with, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you want to make a world better place, Traffic Cam is a blast of icy fresh air. Traffic Cam is an app developed by the Exchange Initiative, an organization fighting back against sex trafficking. And it goes on to say, the goal of the new app is to build a national database of photos of the insides of hotel rooms to help law enforcement match images posted by sex traffickers to locations. In an effort to map out the routes and methods used by traffickers, the app will also be used to help locate victims and the people who put them in their predicament. And it goes on to say that this is available for both Android and iPhone. And mm -hmm. there are some t st statistics that they mention in this article. It says, st sex trafficking is a form of modern-day slavery that forces children and adults to engage in sexual acts for money against their will, which is bad enough in itself. But UNICEF points out that the problem is much bigger than you might think. At least 300,000 American children and more than 1.2 million children worldwide are trafficked each year. And when we say children, that's where the horror deepens. Most victims are recruited between the ages of 12 to 14. So um, it, of course, goes on, but it's called Traffic Cam, T-R-A-F-F-I-C-K, C A M and I believe the intention is that if you choose to install this app on your phone you can help volunteer to build this database by taking shots of the interior of your hotel so it's a very interesting notion cuz you know of course we have databases of photos of offenders as well as you know, even school children get their hands fingerprinted to help us mm -hmm. be able to find missing children. So this uh, seems to just be an extension of the technology angle. We can, you know, possibly identify our surroundings, kind of like the Google Maps, but for interiors. Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. Yeah, this sounds like a really good idea. It, uh, it, it, never, it never dawned on me that that might be helpful, but yeah. Mm -hmm. It probably is, and it, I, I'm thinking that it might be more helpful for the less elegant hotel that you stay in, or motel. Mm -hmm. It would be more helpful than than the more elegant things. Out in the far and that's all the time we have for this episode. 
We hope you'll join us next time when we bring the far away nearby. Thank you for listening to The Far Away Nearby. You can visit our webpage at tfnpodcast.com. Find our fan page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TFNDJ. Our show is available on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Send us an email at tfnpodcast at gmail.com or call and leave a message at 720-230-6919. This show is a proud member of the Pride 48 Podcasting Network. Check out other great podcasts at pride48.com slash shows.